Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. I'm with Sir Richard Lees this afternoon. We both uh, just attended the fifth meeting of the Great Manchester COVID Emergency Committee. Plenty to update you on this afternoon, but I'm going to start by handing the floor to Sir Richard uh, for an update on uh, health matters. So, Sir Richard. Uh, uh, thanks, Andy. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm, I'm actually here. It's not true that I've been banned from the weekly Greater Manchester press conference, uh, although I might be after this afternoon, of course, but we'll uh, uh, we'll wait and see. I'm going to uh, start with the uh, uh, health stats and uh, understand that the Secretary of State has uh, announced today that the uh, UK as a whole has reached the peak. Uh, from the figures we've got, we don't think we're quite there in uh, Greater Manchester uh, yet. And the number of cases has uh, uh, gone up, although the rate of increase has slowed uh, uh, quite uh, significantly. Uh, it was uh, 5,065 5, the total number of cases uh, as of yesterday, and that compares with 3,817 a week early. So there is still uh, a substantial increase, but to say that the rate is of increase is slowing down. Uh, there's also been uh, an increase, sadly, in hospital deaths. Uh, that figure has just topped the thousand mark in Greater Manchester now, a thousand and eight. But again, we've seen the uh, the increase in that stabilise, and it's on a downward trajectory now. Which, uh, uh, whilst any death is bad news, that it's going uh, down. The situation appears to be improving. <coughs> it's clearly uh, good news, and the same can be said about. Uh, uh, hospital admissions for uh, COVID uh, related reasons is that that's now been on a downward trajectory for about 12 days uh, now and similarly occupation of intensive care unit beds is also on a, a downward trajectory that's been uh, that way for about 10 days and um, we are only using 55 percent of total hospital capacity in Greater Manchester uh, at the moment so uh, it's probably a little bit early to uh, start thinking about business as usual but there is certainly going to be discussions over the next uh, seven days about uh, how we make sure that we if we can use that capacity we do use the uh, uh, use that capacity and um, two other things that uh, relate to that to talk, those are the uh, uh, deaths in hospital. By the end of this week, we in, uh, intend to have in place a primary care uh, dashboard. So we ought to be able to give similar stats about what uh, is happening through GPs practices in, in relationship to uh, COVID. And we're also uh, developing this is, uh, I, I think, quite uh, innovative. It's, I don't think it's done anywhere else, but we are also developing uh, an adult social care dashboard as well for that's COVID-19. Uh, related, which will go alongside something that's called an OPAL model, which is uh, operational pressures escalation levels. Is, but basically, it means that uh, we'll be able to use that data to, uh, by collecting data across Greater Manchester on the same base, uh, to be able to provide support and mutual aid where and when it is uh, needed, and whether that is staffing or whether it's uh, PPE. So I think that's uh, uh, going to be a very positive innovation that will have benefits post COVID-19 as well. That that will be something that will be used uh, in the long term. And I suppose looking at things that are positives, um, COVID-19 is creating uh, quite a lot of innovation, quite a lot of drive. But one of the uh, new pieces of work that's now coming into play is uh, a, a system for uh, uh, record keeping that basically uh, GPs, uh, hospitals, care providers will be able to have a shared health record. So for professionals working with a particular patient, instead of having to send things backwards and forwards, they will now be able to share the same computerised uh, uh, record. And I, I think clearly that's very, very important. And again, we'll have long term benefits uh, uh, for us going uh, going forward. Um, Couple of issues I want to uh, raise alongside the uh, stats. Um, first of all, something that has been raised before, and this is people not uh, uh, presenting. And uh, I cite three areas where the numbers for presentations are, are down. Uh, one of them are this is uh, the uh, cancer two week referrals. I think there's something like 30% of third down on what we would normally uh, ex expect. 
and uh, that's certainly very very worrying a and e presentations which previously reported are low are getting lower uh, the number of people going to a and e is reducing further and uh, again very worryingly paediatrics number of children and young people who are seeing the doctor or going to a uh, hospital has also uh, gone down um, on a and e and uh, looked at who isn't presenting and it's quite often people who might have had a, a mini stroke or people that have had a mild uh, heart heart attack exactly the sort of people we we need to get in order to prevent more serious damage further down the track and that obviously applies to the cancer two week uh, referrals uh, as well uh, on children uh, there is a, a national campaign being launched at the end of the week to uh, give information to parents very clear about when they should contact their gp when they should phone 111 when they should take their child to uh, uh, a and e but I think one thing we want to really stress is that uh, for people who are frightened of contacting a doctor or hospital because um, of, of COVID-19, uh, phone first. All, all referrals now go through the, the, the phone first and the system makes sure that anybody who's reporting COVID-19 uh, symptoms is kept separate from uh, other people. So I really want to get that message over. Uh, if your child is ill, if you think uh, you might have uh, symptoms that suggest can, uh, cancer, uh, if you think you might have had a stroke or any of those things that you would normally go to A&E with, go. It's really important that people recognise that the National Health Service is still open uh, for all and people who've got uh, symptoms that require medical attention should be seeking medical attention and not being frightened off from it. Um, I think uh, the only uh, the other issue I wanted to uh, mention, although we're doing more work on this, but there are the early signs that uh, issues around mental health are on the increase uh, as well. That's simply by the number of people who are uh, ringing into the 24-7 uh, phone lines that mental health have, uh, have, have set up. And it was always a concern that uh, isolation would start to have mental health impacts and we are beginning to see those. I'll finish with that. Thanks very much, uh, Richard. I want to address uh, four issues uh, this afternoon. Um, those being PPE. Um, secondly, household waste recycling centres. Thirdly, homelessness. And fourthly, uh, Metrolink. So if I could take those um, issues uh, in, in turn. PPE, you remember, was a major uh, issue on this uh, call uh, last week and remains a, a serious concern uh, for us. But today I can report uh, an improved uh, position. That's partly down to uh, more frequent um, local resilience forum drops that the government are organising. They, they have uh, hit a more regular uh, rhythm now, which is welcome. But it's mainly down to the efforts um, that Greater Manchester has taken on its own initiative to source uh, PPE on the open open market. Today we were uh, presented uh, for the first time uh, with um, a table on our dashboard, which is levels of PPE in the non-acute system. So pretty much for social care, but for other uh, council run public uh, services particularly. Um, and what that reveals is we have a uh, a good supply, a double figure of days in most classes, but when it comes to fluid resistant masks, we are down uh, to just a three day uh, supply. And it's been a source of frustration for us that a major consignment of, um, of masks that we were able to buy has uh, pretty much been sitting at Heathrow Airport for the last um, uh, five or six uh, days. It's finally on its way, it's on the M6. And that is a million masks coming into Greater Manchester this afternoon, which is a, a fantastic effort by the team uh, here that have been uh, leading those those efforts. It's frustrating that the uh, bureaucracy is still uh, in our way, but I just want to, to um, report today that there is a, an improved position on PPE, uh, but we continue to work very, very hard indeed uh, with colleagues in the health service to ensure that there is uh, no uh, risk to, to supply and that remains challenging, but we are making progress. On um, the second issue, household waste uh, recycling uh, centres, um, there has been some comment from some councillors in Greater Manchester that I took a unilateral uh, decision to, to close 
household waste at recycling centres. I, I can uh, assure you that wasn't the case. Of course, in effect, it was a government decision to close them because um, people were not permitted um, to uh, deviate from the stay at home message for that uh, for that purpose. And certainly Greater Manchester Police uh, wanted to um, uh, to uh, reinforce that that message. And indeed, across the country, household waste recycling centres um, have been closed for some time. In more recent days, there has been a, a loosening of the guidance for, from the government, particularly from MH uh, CLG and uh, and also um, the uh, Environment uh, Department. Uh, and what we're uh, kind of seeing now is uh, the ability for um, uh, a decision to be taken locally uh, to towards partial uh, reopening. So this was debated uh, today by the um, the nine leaders who are uh, the members of the Greater Manchester uh, Waste Authority. An agreement was reached in principle uh, to reopen some of our 20 household uh, waste recycling uh, centres. Um, it's likely that that partial reopening would happen within the next uh, fortnight. So uh, that is uh, good news for those who are uh, wanting to, um, to, to take uh, waste uh, away from at their home uh, for those who have concerns about fly tipping, which we recognise. Um, for more details, uh, people need to go to the Recycling uh, for Greater Manchester website. Um, so that was will be where localised information about the reopening uh, will appear. So um, that's uh, a decision uh, taken today uh, and it will be obviously carefully, uh, carefully monitored and, and introduced. Moving on to the third uh, issue. Uh, homelessness. Uh, people who have uh, come onto this call before will know that this has been a, a concern of Greater Manchester from the start because of the work we've been doing on homelessness. Uh, we were early adopters of the government's everyone in policy. In fact, we introduced such a policy uh, in advance of, of the government, but the government did then um, come forward with the same policy. To give you an update in terms of the figures, uh, we predicted at the start of this that we would have around a thousand and three people uh, who might need the support of single room uh, provision, those being either people currently sleeping rough or those who were in our shelter provision, but in provision where there couldn't be um, safe isolation and therefore new accommodation was needed. As of today, I can report that we have helped 1,140 people uh, through uh, the efforts that our councils our voluntary organisations uh, have been making, which have been quite honestly astounding, the amount of effort that people have put uh, into uh, this. However, I can also report uh, the latest figure being that we still have 115 people sleeping rough uh, in uh, Greater Manchester. And people might ask, well, why, why is that the case? It's the case because there are people coming onto the street through this who perhaps are finding that their arrangements, possibly a sofa surfing arrangement has has broken down, but also frustratingly for us on the latest figures, we are still seeing people released from prison uh, to um, to no fixed address and that is adding uh, to the problem. Evictions in some cases haven't stopped completely. So we are seeing people coming onto the street as a result of the, um, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And this is where I, I need to challenge the government uh, this afternoon and particularly on this everyone in uh, policy. Um, while I'm proud of what we've done, I think it's going to become increasingly hard to sustain the position unless the government um, also uh, uh, makes some changes. At the beginning, the everyone in policy um, asked us to identify people uh, who, who needed help. We've now received clarification from the government um, that it's only that pre-identified group who are going to get funding uh, through any government uh, assistance. Um, and they do not recognise, it would seem, people who come newly onto the street uh, in this uh, crisis moment, as many have, as I've just said, indeed some of them from prison, you could say, where the government had a responsibility uh, to, to house them. Furthermore, uh, we've had an indication that um, there will now be no relaxation of the no recourse to public funds uh, policy for uh, people who are uh, not uh, UK UK citizens. So 
this is a frustrating position to be in because effectively it means everyone in isn't the policy and uh, we are seeking clarification from the government about where we go uh, from here and I would argue that everyone in should mean everyone in and that isn't just people who were homeless before uh, before lockdown but those who've been made homeless as a result of the pressures of, of recent uh, of recent weeks uh, and that's a debate we have to have with the government. There should be a positive legacy for homelessness uh, coming out of this, but if the government sticks in the position that it's in, that will become more and more difficult uh, to uh, achieve. I would want to carry on working to a true everyone in uh, policy, and I need the government's support in that, and I'll be having that discussion uh, with uh, ministers. Of course, it all means that we're going to need to raise uh, funds ourselves uh, to support Greater Manchester's ambitions uh, around homelessness. And I just want to pay tribute to the Manchester Evening News for working with uh, the Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity in launching COVID-19, a fundraising campaign for people who are homeless, but other vulnerable people in our communities uh, throughout this um, uh, this crisis moment. Uh, it's a hugely appreciated move, and we would encourage people um, to um, to support it. Um, finally, to turn to Metrolink. Uh, I gave an update yesterday on the position uh, that we were facing the real prospect of having to wind down Metrolink operations within a matter of days if we didn't uh, receive any uh, government support. We've been in discussion with discussions with the government for a number of weeks now uh, without any resolution uh, as to a, a funding package to cover the massive uh, shortfall that we're now uh, seeing in, in revenue. Um, there have been some indications um, overnight that the government is prepared to come forward with a funding package but we still have no idea at what level uh, that funding package will be and even if we were to move to a, what we call a mothball situation that would um, require a significant amount of money to, to, to keep the service ticking over uh, so that it doesn't go into a completely um, uh, locked down position. So it's frustrating, uh, but there are some signs we might have a resolution soon. Um, if the government doesn't fund us to the level we need, it still could still be possible that we'd have to look at a, a mothball situation. Uh, if there is a, a medium amount of funding, uh, we would be able possibly uh, to, to maintain a, a service. In all instances, I can just assure those people who are going out to work at this moment in time, who are keeping the country running, most importantly, who are caring for our loved ones in hospitals and social care settings, that I will continue to find a way of running uh, public transport services that enable them uh, to get uh, to work. So no decision on Metrolink today. We are expecting a, a package from the government or an offer from the government later this week. So it'll be at next week's committee meeting that a decision will be taken on the uh, future provision of Metrolink services. So that's enough uh, from me. I'm going to bring Richard back for uh, an update on the economy and then we will open up to your questions. Richard. Uh, Richard, uh, I think you're still on mute. Uh, OK, thank you, Ross. Um, apologies for that. Um, so uh, a quick word, uh, addition on health before I turn to the uh, economy, which we are uh, preparing a, a campaign on paediatrics and, and children's health. But the national campaign is, a camp and uh, there is one of the questions I think is on the list around this, is uh, an NHS is open for business uh, campaign. So uh, I mean, we will obviously be supporting that about getting that message over to people that uh, if you're ill, contact your doctor, ring 111, uh, go to uh, A&E. &A &E. Don't leave it because things get worse. Uh, turning to the economy and again uh, our dashboard uh, shows that now 92 percent of businesses that have been surveyed are reporting uh, that they've got COVID-19 uh, Im impacts uh, almost 80 percent decreased uh, sales um, 37 percent I'm rounding by the way uh, are reporting cash flow uh, issues so there, there is a major impact on business within Greater Manchester. Uh, clearly through the growth company 
Uh, we've been uh, providing advice and support to business. Uh, we announced last week, and Andy announced last week, the three million pounds that we've made available to invest into business through the local enterprise uh, partnership. And all those businesses that have been entitled to a reduction in business rates, all of those have now been uh, implemented. So there are uh, reduced or in some cases zero uh, rates bill for all the businesses that are uh, eligible. And we've made a lot of progress in paying grants out to those businesses that are eligible for uh, uh, grants. Um, still work to do that. And uh, uh, there are several hundred going out uh, every, every day. And clearly there are st statistics being published nationally uh, around uh, that now. Just one health warning on that is that nowhere will ever reach the 100% uh, figure for a whole range of uh, reasons. But one of them is that not all the companies that are uh, uh, believed to be eligible are going to apply uh, uh, anyway. And that's the evidence that's uh, coming in. But for all those that have applied, they are being processed. Quite a lot of uh, businesses uh, councils have had to go back for additional information or for different uh, information and councils have also had to weed out a fair number of claims that uh, uh, appear to be fraudulent but, but the money is going out. We're also been lobbying with support of Greater Manchester MPs on the gaps so there are still gaps for uh, self-employed people in getting support for uh, part-time workers who um, uh, are being working part time rather than being uh, uh, fur furloughed and on the grants position for um, business rates for uh, companies that are in shared accommodation where business rates are paid through effectively as part of the rent of the landlord. So uh, they ought to be eligible, but they're not eligible for support. And that again is something we've been taking up with uh, with ministers. The planning for economic recovery is uh, getting underway. Uh, now it's it is early stages of that, uh, obviously because uh, lockdown is continuing for a, a couple more weeks. We are getting the message over that for businesses that are capable of keeping going, with people either working at home or working in a, a manner that meets Public Health England's guidelines, uh, they should keep going because the the best way to uh, make sure we've got economic re recovery is to keep business going. As, as far as possible, but we do recognise that there's going to be a major task of getting business up and running as we start to come out of uh, uh, lockdown. That work has begun, but it is going to be made more difficult be, by the resources that were uh, are available to councils to support that uh, process. I, Andy was talking earlier about uh, Metrolink. Some of you will have seen the letter that I, along and letters that other leaders have written to uh, the Prime Minister about the funding uh, position. Uh, we have got a, an aggregate figure for Greater Manchester on uh, the additional costs from COVID-19 and the loss of income as a result of COVID-19. Uh, the aggregate figure is £541 million pounds, uh, across the 10 districts. The money that's come in from government is 89 million. And even if, the, uh, if we get the same amount from the additional 1.6 uh, billion that was announced over the weekend, that will still only take us to 178 uh, million. And nowhere near that 540 million. And I think there is a, a real challenge to government that uh, it needs to be local government, the combined authority in the 10 districts that are going to drive uh, re recovery forward. How are we going to do that if we don't have the resources to do it? And at the moment, there is a major gap in our resources. Uh, I'll finish with that, Andy. Thanks very much, Richard. So, uh, Ross, would you like to um, field the questions for us and allocate them? Uh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to try and group them uh, as much as I can. So I'll take the first two from the first one from Michelle Livesey at Hits Radio 205. Uh, she's asking, we've had a few people contacting us about drug taking outside Fairways Lodge in Presswich, where a number of homeless people are being housed due to the crisis. Some families with children have even found needles in the back gardens. What's being done to make sure that people aren't faced with this on their doorstep, but also that homeless people with drug addictions are getting the help they need? And if you want to take that first, and Richard may want to come in on that one. And just as well as that, Hannah Miller from ITV's asked at 2.17, do we have any numbers on how many people you think 
think have come newly onto the streets since the crisis. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Ross, for those questions. So, firstly, to Michelle's question, um, I, I think there there are um, uh, those reports, and they've gone to Berry Council because the facility is within uh, Berry Council, uh, and uh, they're recognised, and steps are in hand to um, to, to deal uh, with those uh, issues and to ensure there isn't any uh, any signs of drug taking or drug paraphernalia. So, you know, we fully understand residents' concerns and I think Berry Council have been working on that. We also recognise though that there is more to be done to support people in uh, hotel or single room accommodation uh, who have addiction issues or mental health issues. So, uh, you know, this is a new service. As you've just heard, we've stood this up within a matter of, of weeks. Um, but, um, you know, we are working hard to, um, to deal with the issues that um, that arise from uh, that in the same way that we had to do that when we launched uh, a bed every night for the um, for the first time. I'm just uh, seeing if I can find the the figures on new uh, arrivals to the uh, newly homeless, um, which weren't projected in our original figures. This was Hannah's question. The figure I, I was just looking on my papers for the meeting. The figure I was given today, Hannah, uh, was that there have been 344 people uh, newly homeless in this period uh, requiring uh, accommodation. And this is the issue. Effectively, as we, I understand it, the government is saying we're not going to pay for those. We will only pay for the pre-identified uh, population. But my point is, how is that then a meaningful everyone in policy? I don't think the public, I certainly wouldn't draw the distinction between people who were homeless before and people who've been made homeless by uh, lockdown and of course some some you might say have been made homeless by the government because they've released them from prison but they haven't helped them uh, find somewhere uh, to go then there's the issue of no recourse to public funds so this is an issue that i'm going to challenge the the, the government on you know a huge amount of people here are working really hard uh, to, to look after people in this period but also hopefully deliver a, deliver a, a lasting legacy on homelessness uh, and help large numbers of people away uh, from the street. To pull the drawbridge up in this way and say, oh, well, you're only homeless if you were homeless before, I'm afraid is not an acceptable approach uh, to this issue. And I think the, the government needs to re-clarify um, its policy back to a true everyone in policy. And it needs to fund ourselves, it needs to fund our councils properly to run a service that is truly everyone in. I think that's what the public wants. Uh, certainly what, what, what I would be calling for and that's the message I'm wanting to communicate through you today. I don't know if Richard wants to come in on either of those points. Uh, if I can just come in on the uh, the Fairways Lodge uh, issue very uh, briefly. Uh, this is uh, part of the emergency accommodation that's been put in place as we deal with the crisis and this has been commissioned jointly by uh, Manchester and Bury councils and so actually an example again of councils working together to tackle problems rather than trying to do uh, everything that themselves. Uh, we are uh, both councils and uh, working with GMP to resolve uh, issues uh, there uh, and we will ensure that people do behave in a way that's appropriate to a residential area if they w wish to continue to uh, stay there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, through uh, our mental health trust and through uh, public health services, is that we do have a suite of uh, support for people with drug and uh, alcohol abuse uh, uh, problems, and we will try and ensure that the people who need it get that support. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to take uh, some questions on transport now. Uh, I've got a few questions from Tom Burridge, um, who's transport correspondent at the BBC, uh, 215. He's asking, and I think he's probably got one for Andy in the first instance, uh, do you think there, sh there should be some uh, effort to maintain a level of social distancing on public transport once the government starts to incrementally lift the lockdown? Do you think that some form of social distancing will actually be possible uh, once restrictions are gone and do you agree with the Mayor of London that masks should be worn by everyone on public transport when it's up and running again and I'm just going to take 
uh, a couple of connected ones to that as well. Uh, Andy Bounds uh, for the Financial Times has asked at 2.23, uh, you said a medium amount of money was needed to avoid mothballing moth Metrolink. How much was that? Uh, and finally, um, one from uh, uh, 2.27, uh, it says anonymous, so I think it's Jennifer Williams at the MEN. Uh, could you explain how you will keep public transport running for frontline workers, even if a medium amount of government bailout um, it could still see it mothballed? I, I missed, you cut out there, Ross, on that last question. Could you just repeat that? Apologies, yeah, it's um, it's 2.27 and the question's from Anonymous, but I believe it's Jennifer Williams at the MEN mm -hmm. and she's asking you, Andy, um, please could you explain how you will keep public transport running for frontline workers, even if a medium amount of government bailout could still see it be mothballed? OK, thanks. Um, thanks for those questions, colleagues. So, um, Tom, on, on your question first, um, I've been given a very uh, clear, um, not so much instruction, but expectation from government that um, as we move away from this position and towards recovery, public transport will not return to normal immediately. It will have to be operated uh, with social distancing built in uh, to ticketing arrangements and then of course arrangements on, on trams and buses um, in our case. Uh, so that's our expectation. Um, and of course, that then has implications for revenue, because if the same number of people can't travel on uh, trams, um, then uh, there is potentially then a loss, a loss of income. So we're looking at a challenging position. We, we think it's right actually to, to operate uh, social distancing uh, on public transport, but it's why we need to come to an agreement with the government about managing the implications of that, because obviously the functioning of a mass transit system like Metrolink is critical to the economic revival of our city region. Um, and so we need a kind of sensible agreement here. You know, how is the government going to get the regional economy going if it's not helping us to fund our transport uh, system? Um, on the masks issue, um, I think the London context is, is different. But I do think once we're getting back towards uh, people using public transport again in bigger numbers you know it might be very hard to have the strict distancing uh, between people on uh, tram uh, uh, or bus uh, carriages and in that instance I understand why people are starting to talk about encouraging or uh, recommending people to put some kind of uh, face covering on uh, as I understand it it doesn't have to be a health service standards you know people even a simple um, covering uh, would de offer a degree of protection. That's an issue we're going to have to look at, but we are aware that experts are advising ministers and there's going to be a, uh, a recommendation on this soon. So we will, we will look carefully at that uh, recommendation. But I think it's a, 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 an, in, a an assumption that has a growing um, um, sort of salience that we might have to operate public transport, whereby we're recommending to people that they take steps to, um, to risk uh, to minimise the risk of passing on infection uh, to others. In terms of Andy's question, and I, th I think um, uh, Jen's question as well around the financing of, of Metrolink, you know, it, it's a difficult uh, uh, scenario that we're looking at because we're losing uh, about five and a half million uh, pounds a month at the moment, and Metrolink is overwhelmingly funded through its uh, fare box, so it's an unsustainable uh, position. Um, we're told that a range of funding has got into the government and they're saying that uh, local sources might be needed to um, to supplement the position. It's a very difficult thing because where where is that money uh, coming from? Uh, because obviously uh, we've got limited access of, to, to local funds to support uh, what the government might say. It would cost a couple of million pounds or so to uh, effectively to mothball at Metrolink. This is this um, ticking over, the warm running idea where you've got the system ready to to come back, but not completely shut down. Um, and if if we were to um, to receive, let's say, um, let's say three million pounds from the government, you know, we, we would have to use a lot of that just to do that warm running, mm -hmm. that ticking over, and then possibly then providing some extra bus services to replace the critical Metrolink services that we were losing. That's not somewhere where we want to be. I need to stress this again. We want to keep our Metrolink system running. In the second city of England, the government of the United Kingdom should be putting in place an arrangement in these 
circumstances that are way beyond our control, they should be putting in place a, a support system to allow our mass transit system to run, even if it is for those 5% of people who are going out to work in our supermarkets, in our care homes, in our hospitals. So, you know, we look forward to concluding this discussion with the government, but I, I think it's very important that they recognise that we have limited means of supplementing uh, any offer from them and they need to, to put in place an arrangement that allows Metrolink to come back to life as we move back uh, towards a position where people are going back to work. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to take a question on recycling centres um, from Joseph uh, at the Bolton News and Berry Times at 2.18. He's asking, Andy, has it been agreed which recycling centres will reopen? What is that decision based on and why not open all centres? Also, Kevin Fitzpatrick at 2.32, his first question is, what are the safety considerations for TIPS reopening and why will it take two weeks? So, um, as I said before, uh, full uh, details will be uh, published uh, shortly. It's not full uh, reopening, it's partial reopening. And part of the reason for that, it's difficult to staff all uh, 20 recycling centres. But also there are different arrangements in place now in different boroughs. Uh, in some cases, I think Richard may want to mention this, in Manchester's case, more is being picked up from the doorstep. So that then creates issues around the use of, of sites. Um, and the, um, the, the the logistics around them. So what we are going to do is uh, bring forward uh, proposals that people will be able to see soon. It will be a, uh, a localised um, announcement for each uh, borough in terms of which sites will be available and when. There'll be different arrangements for weekdays and weekends. Uh, and all of this is being done with an eye to maintaining the safe operation of those centres. It, it may be known that Wigan has uh, opened its sites over the last uh, few days and the leader and chief executive of Wigan updated our meeting today uh, and said that, um, you know, overall uh, things had, had worked uh, as well as they could have hoped uh, and that um, the, the sites were, were effectively managed through that period. And of course, that has given some <coughs> confidence for people to move forward with this decision. So it's not the full reopening of all 20 sites. The list will be published shortly on the website I mentioned uh, and um, you know we think this is responding to the call that's been made but it has to be done in a careful way working with Greater Manchester Police and that is what we will do. Thank you very much. I've got two questions for Richard. Um, the first one is from Victoria Glover at Hits Radio. Uh, Richard, you say that Greater Manchester, it's was 2.23, apologies, Victoria Glover. Um, you say Greater Manchester is yet to reach the peak of the virus. Do you have any indications of when the peak may be and why uh, it's delayed compared to other areas of the country? Uh, and just below that is Jennifer Williams' question, which I think you've seen. Um, Jen says, we're really keen to get clear guidance from the NHS here on what people need to do and what they can expect if they have health and health concerns other than coronavirus. But we've been struggling with A&E uh, attendance and cancer referrals substantially lower. Please can you give a bit more detail on how people are safeguarded from the virus when they go to hospital with something else, such as separation uh, from people with COVID. Um, and also there's some other, there's another question there about uh, hot and cold, which I think you can see. Yeah, OK. Uh... I think I wasn't as precise as saying that we hadn't hit the peak. I, I, what I said was we don't think we've hit the uh, the peak and it's not a, like a lot of this a precise uh, uh, science and so the uh, number of cases is continuing to uh, increase. Uh, certainly uh, the number of deaths has continued to increase although the number of people being hospitalised and particularly the number of people in intensive care is uh, is, is going down. Uh, there are always, uh, I think, uh, elements around this. It may be that we are now diagnosing more cases because as the uh, epidemic has gone on, more people are presenting themselves with COVID-19 uh, uh, symptoms, so we know more, more about it. The signs are that uh, we are, if we're not at the peak, we are approaching the peak because there is a very clear levelling off uh, take, taking place. I think if you look at the statistics uh, around the country, you will see that um, 
different places have had spikes at different uh, different times that they've had dips at diff uh, different times and clearly the government figures are averaged across across the country but you will see uh, the variations and that's what we're seeing uh, seeing here so i don't think there are any particular reasons uh, for it and i don't think we're particularly out of line with elsewhere uh, i think we used to describe ourselves as being maybe 10 to 14 days behind uh, london now that's probably is still the uh, still the case which does put us into a position that if we haven't hit the peak we should be doing it very very soon uh, on uh, uh, the questions that for Jen about uh, clear guidance. Clearly, uh, the campaign that will be launched, the national campaign, will uh, have clear guidance about uh, what you need to do. We can provide an example of <coughs> the materials we're using around uh, children in particular, which is an advice to parents and quite happy to circulate the leaflet we're using there that is very clear advice to parents about what they should do in uh, different circumstances. So. We are working to get those messages uh, out so that we do get the people who need medical attention seeking uh, medical attention. Um, in terms of safeguarding uh, people, and um, uh, there, are, there are two things for people with mild symptoms, uh, consultations with the GPs now are all initially either by text, telephone or, or online. So there is clearly safety in reporting your symptoms in that way with somebody with COVID-19 symptoms where there, it, there is believed to be a need to have a physical examination, then they will be referred and given an appointment to one of the things that are described as the hot sites. And there are a number of uh, hot sites, there's at least one in every uh, uh, district and they will be referred to that where they will be seen by appointment separately. Uh, and generally speaking, not everywhere, but mainly in a separate location uh, to other patients. For those people who are seriously uh, ill with symptoms where uh, they, they might be uh, dialing 999, we're clearly telling people with COVID-19 symptoms that they should not be taking themselves to hospital, that they should be calling uh, for, for support and then the assessment is done by uh, uh, paramedics. That means that they, if they do need to be admitted to hospital, they can be admitted uh, separately to uh, other, other patients and to wards that are specifically for COVID-19 patients. Even where you've got hospitals treating uh, uh, other uh, illnesses, um, I'll give the Christie as an example. Uh, the Christie now has uh, uh, COVID-19 wards so that patients receiving cancer treatment there who have COVID-19 uh, symptoms are uh, basically kept separate from other patients within the hospital. Which I think covers uh, that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think thanks very much. Uh, Richard, I'm sorry, the, the question partly um, it says uh, hot, uh, the hot and cold. If it's not hot, it's cold is the answer to that bit. Thanks very much. Uh, Richard, there's a question at 2.26 from Joseph at the Bolton News and Berry Times asking, will councils have to pay the government back for any money not handed out to business through the grants if not all those believed to be eligible will apply or can they use the remaining money to fund other business support schemes? Uh, I think the answer to that is I don't know. Uh, I think it also it's extremely unlikely that we'll be able to use the money for other things. But also the concern we have at the moment is not about whether we have to hand money back. It is whether e even without a 100 percent take up, uh, whether there is sufficient money being allocated for all the businesses that are, are eligible. And if I take the city of Manchester as an example, uh, the allocation for the city is around 120 million and uh, we believe that the potential demand is near 150 million. So it may be actually we're going back to government to ask for more money rather than uh, giving them money back. Thanks very much, um, Andy. Uh, there's a question at 2.27 uh, that's anonymous, um, but I think it's, it's Jen at the MEN. Uh, last week you said you wanted to see a system in place that would give you an overview of care, home de uh, cases and deaths in GM, how much progress has been made on this and do we have localised up to date numbers for suspected care home deaths cases here so far uh, and how many uh, tests have been carried out in care homes and just connected to that as well, Rob uh, at Channel 4, uh, do you have an idea of the numbers of care homes in Greater Manchester which have COVID-19 outbreaks or suspected outbreaks uh, and how much help has been given to speed up uh, testing for care home workers? I can come back to the, either of those questions if that's helpful. 
Yeah. Th thanks, uh, Ross. So um, on Jen's question at first, it's it's what Richard mentioned. Uh, Jen, I'll, I'll just say a little more about it. It's uh, obviously the, the, the jargon is a, a dashboard or an OPAL system. In effect, that is the um, the hospital alert system. That's the model that the OPAL system is, you know, the black alert system that people might be uh, familiar with. So what this does is it takes a range of data and then across a, a whole system can see uh, the organisations that are perhaps going into greatest trouble and therefore, as Richard said, you can uh, get mutual aid and support into those organisations and operate it as a system, which obviously social care has never operated. So this is a very big innovation uh, and a huge amount of work has gone on last week, led by Stephen Pleasant, the uh, chief executive of Tameside um, with the uh, directors of adult services. So they've agreed uh, a, a framework basically for this OPAL system uh, in, in Greater Manchester, which would effectively be an early warning system for our care homes and it would be drawing on data around deaths, PPE shortage, uh, infections. So it's it's a it's a pretty significant innovation in a short space of time um, and it should allow us in future to put much more up to date information uh, on what's happening in our in our care homes. Um, we've been working hard actually to pair uh, well performing care homes with those that are struggling and we've had some success in that. But if we can really bring the system through, as Richard said, it could have uh, post COVID uh, benefits and, and we think it's uh, potentially very exciting. It will be applied to care homes originally, um, but then we would want to move it into domiciliary uh, care in, in due course. So uh, it's a, a very significant development and uh, could take Greater Manchester a further stride down towards uh, the road towards much greater integration between health and, uh, and social care. On the question of testing, I don't have the figures, I'm afraid, for the amount of testing that is taking place in care homes, although more testing is taking place uh, in our care homes because more testing capacity uh, has come on stream across uh, Greater Manchester. The government announced that people being discharged from hospital into care homes are being tested and that is being done. But also uh, social care staff have now, now have more ability to access the um, testing capacity at Manchester Airport the Etihad and other sites that have um, have sprung up in in, in recent uh, times. On the question about outbreaks, um, we did give a figure last week um, that there were uh, concerns around. I think it was 226 care homes. So we'd had a, um, a a position around 80 or so care homes giving an alert to Public Health England a fortnight ago. Last week that had risen to 226. And that now stands on the latest figure at 256. So it is increasing. Uh, that is a significant number of care homes reporting an alert, an alert to Public Health England. That doesn't necessarily mean an outbreak, although it could mean an outbreak. It could be other COVID related issues, uh, but that is the latest position uh, as we um, uh, uh, as we stand today. It doesn't mean, to, sorry, I should just say 256 care homes. These are 256 alerts um, and some of them could be two from one one establishment, but you know I think it still tells you that there's a significant issue there. I'm just going to bring Richard in on that point as well. Yeah, just uh, two things to uh, add uh, to that. First of all, in terms of testing, uh, the way testing has been developed, uh, not just in Greater Manchester but elsewhere, means that we have a number of different systems operating alongside each other. Uh, some of them are hospital based, some come through uh, national commissioning of services. Uh, along the other side, the other things that we're doing is developing, again, uh, a coherent structure for testing across Greater Manchester, where we can collect more accurately data about who has and who hasn't been uh, tested, and also that we can uh, be more accurately be able to direct people who we think should be tested to testing uh, facilities. So what's been developed on a very ad hoc basis, we are now putting into uh, a coherent uh, structure. Uh, this is going to be, it's important now, but it's going to be even more important uh, in, in the, as we go into the future and as we move towards the uh, release or softening of, of lockdown, we, and that is the ability to track as, as well. And again, 
across Greater Manchester, we are developing uh, systems and uh, a staffing resource that will enable us to be able to uh, track track contacts, which is a, a crucial element of being able to come out of the situation we're in at the moment. Uh, thanks very much. I'm going to move on to a question from Kevin Fitzpatrick, and there's uh, a part of this question for you, uh, Richard, so we'll take that one first. Uh, how concerned are you that councils won't receive their airport dividend this year, and what would be the impact of losing that? Uh, second part of the question is for Andy. Uh, how long can Greater Manchester sustain the housing of homeless people with uh, with extra government, uh, I'm that's without extra government cash? Well, uh I'll make a general point to Kevin first. I mean, the councils in Greater Manchester and councils across the country have increasingly, in response to austerity, had to raise money in other ways in order to be able to provide uh, crucial services. So councils up and down the country are uh, raising commercial income in order to uh, fill the gaps left by uh, government cuts and Greater Manchester is in exactly that position. Uh, the 540 million I talked about earlier uh, includes um, certainly the extra money that councils are having to spend. It's the money they're losing in fees and charges, but it's also the money that they are losing uh, in, in terms of commercial income, which includes airport uh, dividend. Uh, I think you can be absolutely certain there will not be an airport dividend uh, th th this year. So uh, that's included in those figures. What's the impact of, uh, of that? Well, unless we're compensated by government, the impact of that will be very significant cuts in uh, key services. And as I said in my letter to uh, the Prime Minister, after 10 years of cuts, there isn't a lot left to go at, really. Uh, it would be devastating for uh, the councils across Greater Manchester if we don't get adequate uh, compensation from government for that loss of income. Uh, so thanks, Kevin, for your uh, for your question. Um, so the government has given two um, allocations to local authorities of one point six billion pounds. Uh, and in its list of um, things that it's saying should be funded from that money is support for homeless uh, people. However, the point I was making was they've now clarified the group that can qualify for that, and that's people who were pre-identified before the COVID uh, lockdown. So obviously anyone newly homeless is outside of that, and that's an unfunded pressure. And uh, as I say, some of that pressure is created by the government themselves uh, in terms of their policies on prison release uh, and no recourse to public funds. So it's not an acceptable uh, position. Of course, we had provision before this, a bed every night, and there was a budget that we'd created to support that. Uh, and some of that uh, still uh, still remains. Um, but we did find our own money to stand up this, some of that money to stand up this new, this new system. Of course, it's much more expensive because bed every night was dormitory style provision uh, and immediately we went to a single room provision and we wouldn't be able to sustain that, of course, forever. But nor could we go straight back to a bed every night uh, because obviously the risk of transmission of the virus in those locations would be high. So we're in a position where we would have to come back down to a modified version of a bed every night using the budget that we have for that, uh, that we've created ourselves, I say again. Um, but possibly if you have to modify those locations, you wouldn't be able to accommodate as many people as we were in the previous model of a bed every night. So it's a complicated situation. But the summary is, you know, we may not get the legacy for homelessness that's within our grasp right now because of all of the amazing work that's been done uh, over the last few weeks. If the government is to uh, start moving the goalposts on us now as they appear to be, you know, we lose that opportunity to make a, a kind of real uh, step change uh, in the levels of homelessness and rough sleeping across uh, across the country. Uh, and, you know, it's one thing at the start of this when we're all kind of pulling together and the government says everybody in, uh, it, it doesn't feel right to me in the middle of this to sort of start pulling the rug from, from under people who've been working really hard to help people. And uh, I think we're gonna have to have a serious conversation with the government about this, because as far as I'm concerned, what they're saying is, what they're saying is not acceptable it goes back on what they they promised uh, and we need a different policy 
Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, there's two final questions, uh, both for Sir Richard and then Andy. I don't know if you have some final comments uh, that you might want to, to make at the end. Uh, Richard, uh, Hannah Miller at 240 is asking how many or how much of the additional spending uh, for councils is going on food parcels to the vulnerable? Is that a significant portion of your additional spending or not? And Nigel Barlow's the final question at 247 is asking, um, how worried are you over reports in this morning's papers from studies abroad that appears to suggest that even in hard hit regions, vast numbers of people remain susceptible to the virus and relatively few people are developing antibodies which would prevent a second wave? OK, if I take the uh, uh, second one first, is that as we're now all becoming experts in uh, uh, epidemiology, although I think I, I struggle to say it but, uh, to, uh, uh, as a word, um, I, I think we have to be uh, concerned is the track record on findings vaccines for coronaviruses is uh, not good, although if it is possible to do so, the amount of research that's going into uh, this particular coronavirus, uh, it will be found if it's possible uh, to do to do that. Uh, I think we are expecting that uh, as we come out of uh, lockdown, there is very high chance that we will have, um, hopefully not to the same level, but that we will have recurrence of uh, uh, outbreaks. And certainly part of our preparation going forward is to be able to respond very, very quickly if we do see the signs of new breakdowns uh, uh, coming out. I think the third area is that uh, uh, the, ch the chances of finding an effective antibody t uh, test are again relatively slim, as is the uh, possibility of people developing long term immunity anyway. So the other area that's really important and an area where there is a lot of research taking place is to be able to find effective treatments for this particular uh, coronavirus. And again, there are some signs that there is uh, progress being made in that area that for people with severe symptoms that, that there are trial treatments that appear to be making uh, a difference. So uh, the nature of this particular pandemic means we have to be worried about what's going to happen uh, in the medium to long term uh, future. Uh, but also, I, I think we have to have uh, uh, some confidence that the amount of resource that's going into research at the moment, uh, that we are going to find ways of mitigating the impact, even if there are uh, repeat occurrences of uh, outbreaks of the virus. Um, the In terms of the food parcels, as we do on the dashboard, I'm just finding the number uh, have a bit on uh, vulnerability. So uh, the figures we've got, which I think is actually a bit of a, a, an underestimate actually, is something like uh, five and a half thousand food parcels and, medic and medicine par uh, parcels delivered across uh, Greater Manchester in the uh, pa past week. Uh, clearly, there is a cost uh, uh, to that. I think councils are largely redeploying staff from other areas uh, to, uh, to to manage that, and uh, it's one one of the many areas to, where there is a cost. We're we're adding it up, uh, but we're not thinking, oh, we can't afford it. If people need food, if people need medicine, then we're sourcing that food and medicine uh, and and delivering it. Clearly, there are a lot, a lot of businesses that are providing support. A lot of businesses are providing uh, food to help us uh, with that for those people who can't uh, afford. Uh, afford food, but uh, I can't give you a precise cost on that. It it will be part of the uh, figures, and it's something really we'll worry about tomorrow. The priority at the moment is to get stuff to the people who need it. Thank, thanks, uh, uh, Richard. I I'll just conclude, Ross, by um, uh, thanking to Richard for joining us. Um, all of you uh, for tuning in again. I hope you find these um, these briefings uh, helpful. Um, my kind of summary of where we are uh, would be uh, just to say what I said to the 10 leaders and all of the um, uh, senior uh, officials, the chief constable and others who were on our call this morning. And that is, I think it's phenomenal what's been achieved in Greater Manchester over the four weeks since our committee has been meeting. I think so far we've come through it as well as we could reasonably have expected in terms of the support we put in place through our councils, as Richard was just describing, uh, support for vulnerable residents, but also the systems we've created to um, secure PPE 
on the open market, just to see our hospital and social care system increasingly working as one, uh, something that doesn't happen routinely in other parts of the country. You know, Greater Manchester has pulled together, as it always uh, does. Um, the, 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 the homelessness issue I mentioned, you know, so many people, so many volunteers working in those locations to, to support people. It's uh, it's phenomenal. Um, but it's it's about where we go uh, from here. Um, and to summarise the things I've touched on today, you know, without help uh, on homelessness, without help for our councils, as Richard was saying, without a support package from Metrolink, the recovery from here will be longer and more painful. Um, and we won't capture some of the benefits uh, that we could capture from this um, this this period that we've been uh, that we've been living through. You know, my message to government will be, you know, help us uh, to uh, come back and come back uh, more strongly, uh, more quickly, uh, and of course uh, keep some of the good things that have happened uh, in the last uh, few weeks. That's the message that Steve Rotherham and I were giving out yesterday. Build back better. We can do that. We are ready. We're always ready to play our part in, in doing that. But we do ask the government to be a, to be a partner in that. Leveling up can't be forgotten coming out of this. You know, it's possible that in some parts of the country will be hit harder by what we're going through um, than, than others. And we're going to need uh, that support uh, working with the government. And I think the idea of a National Recovery Council as put forward by the TUC is an idea that should be taken up so that we can build a consensus across the parties, across the country, uh, across the different sectors around what's needed to do to get the country back on its feet. So that will be the summary from me as I see things today. Um, thank you again for uh, for coming uh, on to this and thank you for the way that you're reporting the issues that Richard and I have been talking about today. It's, it's very noticeable that very high quality information is being reported to the public. Uh, we're both grateful for that in this difficult moment and we just wanted to, to say that uh, before closing today's event. So thank you uh, to you all. Thank you, Ross. I think that's today's event over.